And now we're going to move on to Professor Kim Skoog. Uh, Professor Skoog, uh, well, let me ask you, what is special about colleges like MIT and Harvard? They have very brilliant students, but the reason why the students want to be there is because they have fantastic teachers and fantastic presenters. And Professor Skoog has actually presented about 75 papers at various platforms, including such. He's even published more than 25 papers. But the unique thing about his style of teaching is that it's not just about being in a class. He packs up his students and takes them off to Thailand and Mongolia and India and Tibet, Sri Lanka. So it's not the kind of airports where you reach and you have the same shops and the same goods and the same everything. It's the kind of places where you have real life experiences where anything can happen. So Professor Kim Skrug about the circular economy and sustainability. Thank you. All right, oh, I'm up already. Okay, I'll get started here. Um, oops, wrong thing here. Yes, like I say. Got my timer going here. All right. Um, begin with, let me welcome you, welcome myself, I guess, to this meeting. Uh, half a day, that's the tomorrow word for hello in, in Guam. So you can say half a day if you went back, or you don't have to. <laughs> All right, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Enthusiastic crowd here. Um, all right. Um, the, the beginning of my talk, I'm kind of referring to back to where I came from. Um, I guess the first thing is to establish there's a problem. Uh, Micronesia, in case you don't know, is in the Pacific. There's actually three groups of people, Micronesians, Polynesians, and Melanesians. And uh, I live in Guam, which is one of the islands in Micronesia. Uh, it's... Uh, one of the things I guess is sometimes referred to is kind of the canary in the coal mine. Uh, Guam, like many islands, uh, particularly the, the federal states of Micronesia, uh, which is south of Guam, uh, the Carolina Islands, is made of atolls. Atolls are unlike volcanic islands like Hawaii. They're made out of old coral reefs, which at one time were submerged, and as the water rises, they become submerged again. So uh, there's a great concern about this. Um, Again, threat to our existence. Uh, let me just wrote, read a, a quote real quick from the president of Palau. He says, the threat, um, I can't read that one down there. The threat is to our existence, survival, not only at our people, as a culture is real and present. Now we have to just flat beaches, the wash, the wash comes in and hits the roots of coconut trees, um, you know, so on and so forth. So it's, you know, it's really coming really a problem. Um, I said I live on Guam, and because many of the, some of the islands have already uh, become problematic in the tens, sense that when the waves come up from storms, it goes over the crops, puts salt in the water, and so they can't uh, grow, and they have to, and the water the wells get uh, full of salt water. So some of the islands have already been uh, deserted, and so many of the the Chukis, which is the main island, one of the three islands, four islands in the uh, system have started coming to Guam, and so it's putting a lot of stress on us, just like Turkey, I guess, and the ISIS crisis, uh, a lot of people are coming into there, and Jordan, not as bad as that, obviously, but still, it's become a problem. Um, and so, you know, they have to, to figure out something, we have to, we're trying to figure out something to do, but this is maybe just a sign of things to come. Um, uh, let's see. Somehow, I think we got the wrong one, but I guess I'll go ahead and go with it. <laughs> this is an old version of the, uh, the notes here. Um, be flexible, right? Um, okay, well, these are, again, basic questions. I don't really need to read through them. We're, again, we're short on time. Um, but, again, the, the issue is, um, you know, what danger are we currently in? What's responsible for it? Uh, why is it wrong to pollute, uh, create pollution, um, and so on and so forth? Um, and the last question is most important. Uh, what approaches or philosophical frameworks can we adopt to combat pollution uh, and ecological dangers? Uh, there's a, again, we talked about this last time a little bit. This is a little more comprehensive, I hope. But I've listed out five basic positions um, going from ec ec ethical egoism to deep ecology. The next slide is a little more helpful, I think. Um, what are all these? I'll try to make it very quick. But on the left-hand side, we have ethical egoism, which basically says, that you have an obligation to yourself to do what's best for you and you alone, uh, even the exploitation of others. And so uh, you find people on the conservative side, particularly some Republicans in the United States, 
who denied um, global warming was happening, and when they finally couldn't hide it anymore, then they said it's too late, we can't help it, so we just gave up on it. So their main point is that uh, we can't really reduce uh, output from smokestacks and whatnot and, and pollution from cars because that would greatly harm the economy, jobs, and profits. Again, it's most mainly from business business point of view, and so therefore uh, we just have to kind of never mind that's somebody else's problem down the road. Uh, anthropocentric is a little bit more open in the sense that they talk about humans as a measure. What is good for humans is good, uh, and so only when, like again, when you're pollut polluting a beach that might harm the fish you eat, or you can't, the, clo the beach is closed, then you have to, uh, then there's something wrong. But if there's a, a small fish there that's being hurt by it, it's not a consideration. Uh, one, over, one over from that is a little more open area, expanded area, sententialism that says that all, we should have to be concerned about all sentient beings. Uh, so again, that includes, uh, well, a lot of different, we'll talk about this in a minute here, but you know, any intelligent animal that has a self-awareness uh, is now expanded into the domain of concern. So not before, only humans had intrinsic value, where animals were instrumental. Now, in sententialism, uh, all these intelligent animals and uh, life forms uh, ha are intrinsically valuable. Uh, one step up from there, uh, Albert Schweitzer's position of vitalism says that all, there's reverence for all life. All life is sacred. You should never harm any living being uh, except for vital needs. So uh, this is, again, even more extreme where you're recognizing all life forms. And finally, deep ecology, which you mentioned a couple of times before, um, is the view, again, it's kind of a land ethic based on the importance of uh, bio diversity and the idea of self-realization. You begin with yourself, you expand it to all things in the, the universe, particularly the earth. So dirt, soil, uh, anything that is part of the biosystem has equal importance to us. So the question is, where's Jainism in this, <laughs> this chart? I left it out, right? Um, I would say that I think that uh, if you look at the, the basic philosophy behind Jainism, it would fall into the area of sententialism. Again, sententialism holds the view that, again, the moral domain includes non-human non animals. However, I would say that Jainism is much more extreme, uh, or radical in their form of sententialism in the sense that they would expand this to all living life forms. Even sen single-sensed nagodas would also be included in this concern, in this sententialism. Uh, I mentioned here at the end here that uh, I, would not, I would, again, find Jainism to align with sententialism rather than vitalism because, again, the basis of, of Jainism is, in terms of the concern for the animals, is, again, the idea that you have to be concerned about not harming anything uh, rather than some metaphysical doctrine about the sanctity of life. Okay, we're, you know, it's already moving along here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, too. Uh, why is Jainism valuable to analysis of the, to our analysis here? Well, first, it provides a model of, of a, that's from a highly successful society that's been existing for at least three, three millennia. Um, it, it, again, it's based on a very sound uh, philosophical basis, moral basis in terms of respect for life. Uh, and also, it provides an external reference point that's outside of the the more Western concepts we just talked about. So it gives a kind of a check and balance and, and new perspective. Uh, environmental ethics, well, this is again, time is essence here, or, or is drifting quickly here, like the waters off Guam. Uh, so I'll just maybe go through these fairly quickly before we get to a final analysis. Uh, what I did is try to lay, lay out kind of a basic Jane uh, ethic. Uh, again, I provide passages here, but because of time, I'm just going to read or, you know, make reference to the basic point and move on. Uh, obviously, with Jainism, you begin with the notion of ahimsa. This is a basic principle uh, at which an environmental ethic would be based. Uh, also, the recognition that all life strives for self-preservation, avoidance of pain. Uh, ahimsa also arises from the observance of this reality as an attempt to respect the basic tendencies of life. So it's, again, very naturalistic orientation. Uh, also, is uh, ahimsa is directed only towards sentient beings, not nay sentient. So this is why I would again would kind of stray away from the idea of Jainism being seen as a uh, echo uh, echo um, centric kind of uh, philosophy uh, in terms of the mor morality, because again, it's 
they respect, I mean, they don't, only, only jivas have rights or have, you know, considerations. However, dirt and soil and other things that have living organisms in it, obviously you have to be protective of the soil. So it's kind of an indirect uh, respect for the, for the land ethic, uh, not directly the, the plants and the fire and whatnot itself. Uh, also, it's not, ahimsa is not absolute. Again, you recognize that we live in a violent world. It's impossible to totally be, totally avoided of harming anything. Uh, so uh, you have, again, you, I'm sure you're familiar with this, the five levels or five kinds of, of beings. Uh, if you have to harm something, better to ha single, harm a single cell or single sense or second sense rather than a higher one. It's also by camera, this is an important point, so by camera ethic in the sense that it's not only geared towards not harming other living beings, but also it's beneficial to you uh, to live that kind of a life in terms of accumulating karma. Uh, yeah, and also again, intentionality, we'll skip that. Um, and again, it's uh, also there's the idea that you have a moral or, or spiritual obligation to strive towards perfection, towards uh, liberation as part of, of life, as all life is going in that direction. All right, finally the last section, um, exploration or evaluation of Jane position. When we're doing this evaluation, uh, we have a couple of different, three different main things to look for, internal coherence, external coherence, and moral reasonableness. Um, has this, what this means is, again, uh, in terms of eternal, uh, we have, we'll all have internal interests, instincts, and beliefs as human practitioners, uh, and in contrast, we also have a concern, or there is also concern about the external world. Are we harming or interacting with the other living beings? Uh, are we looking out for them? So we look out for ourselves, look out for the other, the other world. There's kind of a, a balance or a, even a tension between these two concerns. Um, and also, finally, there's a notion of ethical, uh, whoa, all right, I guess I have a bad clock here. Uh, ethical reasonableness, uh, can we buy into it and its goals? In other words, in this position, is, is it workable? Does it make sense to practice this point of view? Okay, getting to ethical egoism and anthropocentrism. Uh, this seems to be consistent with our internal instincts. That's the whole point of it. I'm doing what's good for me. However, obviously there's a tension with the outside world. Am I doing something at the expense of someone else? Uh, so there's certain problems. On the other side, in, in kind of a response to that selfish, more selfish orientation, the ecocentric view uh, was created to avoid external tensions and breakdowns of coherence, mutual respect. Um, uh, so, but yet the problems arise again internally. Uh, in, in my, you have to kind of choose between your own self-interest, which seems to be where you want to go, versus something that you're kind of feel like you're compelled to do. So there's still this kind of a tension between the two. Uh, so the, tr the problem also is that deep ecology. Uh, this is again a very simplification, but they provide no real means or method of transformation. Conceptually, you understand the holistic approach of, towards life, but um, Jainis, but they don't really give you a method for this transformation. Whereas Jainism and other Indian schools provide uh, a way through yoga and meditation and whatnot to bring about this re reorientation in your life that makes it much more plausible. Uh, Another point, I guess, to bring up is their idea of multi-perspectivism. We've talked about that several times in this, this, this meeting. Um, it kind of allows you, if you're looking at different perspectives, to kind of integrate the two together and make them consistent. Uh, in terms of ecocentric, the nonviolent position is the best thing for personal, personal growth and liberation. So it's beneficial to you to be kind to other things. In terms of ecocentric, no being wants to, be, wants to suffer Hence, you increase happiness and harmony by following this. So both are kind of harmonized together. Um, regarding the external coherence, Jainism practice of Ahimsa covers a broad range of moral demands. A domain rather includes all life forms. Uh, internal coherence is also maintained as personal interests are not necessarily mitigated to preserve outside entities. Okay, so again, it's kind of repeating what I just said somewhat. Um, about out of time here, so I've got to go fast here. A couple more of slides, and I think we'll have the basic points down here. Um, again, how does Jainism differ from the basic sententialist point of view? Sententialism, uh, as put out by Tom Regan and, and others, uh, holds a middle position, tries to cohere some external interests, uh, other sentient beings, with your own, but it's often seen as shallow ecology, almost done. 
Uh, and again, not really being totally sympathetic. They're still exploitive in nature. Um, whereas with Jain view, they maintain a purely, Jain maintain, philosophy maintains that purely egoistic or selfish thought and actions are ignorant based, ignorant, erroneous states of affairs. And as the aspirant ascends to higher states of awareness, such attitudes fade away, replaced by holistic, altru altruistic attitudes. Uh, he becomes a way of life, a general attitude towards the world. Uh, so again, it seems to integrate uh, the best of both things without having, with, and, and re remitting yourself, removing the tensions. Um, let me add, I guess we're out of time, so <laughs> that's basically it. Thanks very much for your time. Om Arham.